today, uh, yesterday or, or last week, we, we spent the time in John 1, 29. And today we're going to continue forward. So, yeah. So let's open with prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, your servant John the Baptist prepared the way for you. You confirmed to him by a sign, by the Spirit lighting upon you in your baptism, that you are indeed the Christ, the one prophesied in Moses, the Messiah for whom all Israel had been waiting. Send that same Spirit to us by your word, that we may come to know and confess you as the Christ, and according to your promise, have eternal life in your name. Amen. All right. So, last week we covered John 1, 29, where John is preaching, and he sees Je Jesus coming toward him, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Believe it or not, there's actually much more about that verse we didn't cover last week. Chiefly, we didn't bother to define the word... We definitely defined lamb. John confesses that the lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Does this mean then that the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross pays for all sins of all people everywhere? Yes, 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 yes. God so loved the world. He is the propitiation for the whole world. Why is it important for us to know this? Because if Christ died only for part of the world, one, how would you preach that? Christ died for the elect. Gee, hope that's you. It's so liberating. It's, 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 not, it's not even the chief blessing, but it's a, it's a nice blessing that you can just look anyone dead in the eye and tell them Jesus died for you. Jesus died for the sin of the world. Are you part of the world? Yeah. Now, you're not of the world, right? You don't belong to the world, but in this sense, that's you. Yeah. Yes. No, no, this, this is where you're supposed to beat up on the reform, not the Jehovah's Witnesses. That's Revelation. <laughs> yeah, the, the Jehovah's Witness, there's a, there's a whole like, there's a whole thing about like the 144,000's already been filled. And so like there's a, the, like the new converts beyond that, they don't go to heaven. They like live on the new earth. Right. Yeah, it's. It's a total ripoff. Yeah, you get the same blessing Abraham gets. That's the blessing of the true gospel. <laughs> you, get, you get heaven and earth, the whole new creation, life at peace with God, only through faith in Christ, apart from works. Yeah, it, we'll bring this up elsewhere when we see it in John also, that the atonement of the Christ is for the sins of the world. Um, the, the word there in Greek, lest you think that there's some kind of limitation to this, is the word cosmos. Right? Right. Yeah, you, you can imagine like Carl Sagan in his turtleneck talking about billions and billions and billions. That's, but that's the point. It's the whole created order. All of it. Yeah. And then we confess him as the redeemer of the whole universe. All right. Leaving John 1, 29 now, beginning at John 1, 30. This is not a race. John says, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water 
said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Okay. So John was preaching back in verse 19. And then the next day, we see him preaching again in John 29. So he's preaching days in a row, day after day. Jesus comes and he points him out. He makes this confession that he's the Lamb of God, and he tells his hearers, this is the one I've been talking about, right? And he reminds them what he said. First of all, that there's a man who's going to come after me, John says, but he ranks before me. And the reason he ranks before me is because he comes before me. Now, we know that John is born before Jesus. How is it possible then that Jesus comes before John? Yes, yeah, this is a confession of his divinity. When did Jesus begin? When, or when did the Son of God begin? He has no beginning. He always is. Jesus tells the Jews in John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am. He, so this, this is a confession of his divinity, that this, this is true God. Yeah, everyone knew to pray. And, and the, the, the Old Testament describes this promise uh, in many ways. There is a prophet like Moses that God will raise up. Um, God himself will come as a shepherd from Ezekiel 34 and to a lesser extent, Ezekiel 17. Um, you, you've got the kinsman redeemer from the book of Ruth. Um, you, you've got all kinds of different ways that this promise is described, but all Israel knew to expect an anointed one to come and be king over Israel. Now, as we also know, many of them would misinterpret this or have false expectations of what this king was supposed to be like. Because he said he was king in it. Yeah, the word king in it. Well, and, and they think of king, they think he's going to come riding on a stallion with a giant sword. He's, he's going to start lopping off heads and set things right. Now, that will happen, by the way. In the book of Revelation, that is precisely how Jesus comes. When that time comes, you'd better already be on his side, or it's going to be a very terrible day. However, for you Christians, when that day comes, you'll say, that's my king. He's, he's doing this for me. In other words, he won't do it to you. But yes, this coming is very humble. He's born of a virgin, born in a manger, has no place to lay his head. And John's been preaching for we, presumably quite some time. What's Jesus been doing up to this moment? He's, yeah, he's, he's, he's working. Jesus is not out there preaching. He's not baptizing. John has been. But now, and, and the text doesn't make this explicit, but there's an implication here that Jesus has been coming out to John. And, and, and John, John baptizes Jesus. And now, because of this, the, the Spirit has revealed to John, this is in fact the one that, I've, that you've been waiting for. And this is, this is what John says in 31. We talked about this a little last week. He says, I myself did not know him. Now, again, to be fair, he is like a cousin of Jesus or a relative of Jesus. John is aware of Jesus' existence as a man. But that he is the Son of God must be revealed by the Father. Which is exactly, by the way, what Jesus tells Peter 
In Matthew 16, Peter confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, which is what John just preached here in verse 34. And when Peter confesses in Matthew 16 that Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus says what? Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. It's also a reminder, by the way, that you can study apologetics, you can be really good at arguing, you can know all your philosophy, the facts of the faith, you can have uh, ace in the hole with archaeology and linguistics and everything. But if someone is going to confess that Jesus is the Son of God, this comes only by the Father. You can be the most skillful preacher in the world, and yet your hearers may not be converted. This is even true of our Lord himself. Many heard the preaching of Jesus straight from his own flesh and blood mouth, and yet did not believe. And can any of us say, well, Jesus, if you'd just been a little bit nicer, if you'd been more winsome, you can't accuse Jesus of being imperfect. He's God. And yet even his preaching does, did not convert all who heard. No, not his fault at all. It's, it's the fault of their own stubborn hearts. The fault is entirely theirs. It is not God's at all. Their stubborn refusal to believe. Yeah, with the Holy Spirit comes power. So John bears witness in verse 32. To bear witness, we talked about the Greek word here being martyr. But to bear witness means you saw something and then you're telling everyone what you saw. What did John see? This is a reference to the baptism of Jesus, right? Jesus comes to John to be baptized, and John is perplexed. I need you to baptize me. I shall I baptize you? And Jesus says it's necessary for us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus gets down into the water with us sinners. And from that point on then, Jesus' ministry becomes public, right? We, we, we talk about this as the beginning of his public ministry, where he is, he's going to start preaching. Jesus at that point will begin increasing. At the same time, John will, will decrease, right? It's very awkward. We saw this in the life of David, right? David is anointed king, but he's not coronated for quite some time because Saul is still alive. David doesn't, doesn't really begin exercising his, his duties as king until that coronation. John is the last of the Old Testament prophets. They stopped writing 430 years before Christ is born. But John comes, he's kind of like the, he's the tail end there, because like all the Old Testament prophets, his role is preparatory. He's different in many ways, like he sees the Christ in his flesh uh, on earth, but that's, that's why. Because John the Baptist is definitely a martyr, as Jeremiah is a martyr. Okay. So what he is relaying then to his, to his congregation there is that he himself saw, right? God revealed to me that the Christ would be indicated by him by the Spirit of God landing on him, descending on him, right? And this is precisely what John saw when Jesus comes up out of the water. The Father's voice booms down from the heavens. This is my beloved Son, and then the Spirit descends upon him as a dove, right? It would have, yeah, probably would have been pretty um, awesome, but aw not awesome in the like radical dude sort of way, but awesome in the my knees are about to buckle and I'm about to fall on the ground. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you should. <laughs> But the consistent witness of those, especially Peter, those who see his glory, they say that the witness that you have in the written word is better than beholding his glory. 
because it's more certain. The great thing, when you see an event, you usually have to talk with other people who saw it about how to interpret it, right? Well, I saw the car do this, yeah, but I also saw him over, you know, beforehand doing this, and then you all put you, you all put the meaning together. The with the Bible, you get what what was seen and what was witnessed, but with the Bible, you also get the interpretation. How should I take this? What does it mean that this happened? The Bible gives you a very clear witness, whereas when you see things in the flesh, it's not always obvious exactly what you saw or how you're supposed to take it. And then, of course, on top of all of that, you have the specific promise that Christ is in his word. He bestows the spirit. He bestows faith through the word. Faith comes by hearing the word of Christ. So in addition to the certainty, you also get the promise that there is God with you in his word through the word. All right. So he's, he's now telling his, his congregation, I saw this. God told me that the Spirit would descend on the Christ, and then, this, then Jesus, I didn't know this was him until, and again, he's a relative, John is aware of the existence of Jesus, but his identity as the Son of God is revealed by God. He sees the Spirit descend on him, ah. See, when the Spirit descends on someone, that is an indication of God's favor. And the only one in the Bible that the Spirit ever descends on is Jesus. No. First of all, Pentecost, the Spirit descends on the disciples. Right? Well, does that mean that God has favor on the, on the apostles? You bet. But not merely them. Because Jesus will speak of baptism as a washing of water with the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit descends on you. You're entirely right, by the way. Um, <laughs> the Spirit descends on you. Does that mean God has favor toward you? Absolutely. Take it to the bank, right? So this is, this is not just a matter of a one-time occurrence with Jesus. The Spirit descends on the apostles. He descends on you in baptism. Um, now, the purpose for which he does these things is different in, in these cases, the Spirit descends on Jesus, not because he needs the forgiveness of sins, but because this, this is the sign to John that, that the Christ is the Son of God and Jesus is that Christ. But you also notice that Jesus, the Spirit is with Jesus throughout his, his earthly sojourn. For example, after the baptism, who leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? The Holy Spirit does. Matthew makes that explicit, and so does Luke. And here, you have, a, you have a little distinction in, in John's baptism and Jesus' baptism because another sign that was expected and that John makes explicit is that the Son of God, the Christ, baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Jesus will tell Nicodemus, unless one is born of water and the Spirit but also in Titus 3, Paul says that baptism is a washing of rebirth and renewal in the Holy Spirit. And so now, John's preaching is, I have seen this, and I am bearing witness that this is the Son of God. And this is to be a pattern of preaching for Christians from this point on, is that preaching will be a witness of Jesus. Now, no preacher alive now has seen Jesus with his eyes, but he has seen Jesus in a better way. He's seen Jesus through the word. And so, while we may not, have, not we're not apostles in the sense that we've borne witness to the risen Christ with our eyes, nonetheless, we bear witness to the resurrection of Christ by the word. All right, 35. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, 
Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. All right. So John is preaching again. This is now the third day. Um, <clears throat> the third day, <clears throat> you know. Um, <laughs> well, this is preparatory, right? Um, John is preaching again the third day in a row. And John is there. He's, he's standing with two disciples. And, and Jesus walks by and John looks and says, Behold the Lamb of God. Now, John has preached this sermon before. What a terrible preacher. <laughs> He's using recycled material, but you can't improve on it, right? Behold the Lamb of God. Now, again, he preached this message literally the day before. I don't know if these two disciples were there the day before or not. In my mind's eye, I tend to think that maybe they were. At least that's my comfort as a preacher. <laughs> Because what it means, if that, if that were the case, is that they didn't necessarily take it the first time that preaching requires an ongoing effort, that sometimes you hear something and it's completely right, but it doesn't hit you. Sometimes you have to hear something a couple of times and then you go, oh, wait a minute. That's what this is. Whoa, this changes everything. Yep. Re read Mark and really digest. Read Mark, but also read the other 65 books of the Bible. <laughs> horrible, horrible joke, sorry. That's, that's, that's the nature of God's word. You know, it's, it's living and it's active, it's powerful, and our hearts are sometimes sluggish. Yeah, do, I mean, in, in, a, in a healthy family, do the children fear their dad? Of course. But do they love him? Of course. And those are not opposed to each other. They fear him like, in the sense that if, if dad says, I'm disappointed in you, and it just crushes them, because they, they genuinely want their father's affection. Um, so, so John is preaching, the disciples hear it, and this time, it, there, there's, there's not any evidence in, in the text that that second day he was preaching there in verse 29 that anything happened. John preaches, this is the Lamb of God. We don't find the crowds just immediately starting to follow Jesus. But here, now... In verse 35, John preaches exactly the same sermon, and now the, the two disciples start following Jesus. Um, so I, I imagine this is awkward, because it's, it's very common for, for rabbis to, to walk and talk, um, you know, and, and this is not unique to uh, Christianity. The, the, the Greeks did this. You'd have these, they're called peripatetic um, philosophers would just kind of walk and, and talk and, and philosophize and, and people would follow. Um, and so these, these two disciples start following Jesus, but you got to imagine in their mind, what do we say to him? Like, how do, should, should I introduce myself? Should I just shut up and let him talk? What's, so Jesus, he, he initiates the discussion, right? <coughs> Teachers do this all the time with kids that are really awkward. You know, sometimes they have to condescend a little bit and, and smooth things out when students are awkward. Um, I myself was the beneficiary of many such teachers, and so are, these, so are these disciples, right? Jesus turns around, and he asks them a question. And the, the question he asks, and it's not surprising because Jesus is perfect, but what are you seeking? It's a perfect question, <coughs> right? This, this question should be at the forefront of every teacher, right? What, what are you seeking? But it should also be at the forefront of, of the mind of every student. What are you seeking? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah. What do you want? <laughs> right. Yeah, what, what, are you, what are you seeking? What are you looking for? This, this is, by the way, how good teachers use questions to draw out from the student, right? As a matter of fact, that word education means to draw out, like 
like duck toe, right, to, to draw. He's drawing out of them what they're seeking because they probably haven't thought about it. Well, John said, you're the Lamb of God, so like we started following you because he told us to. That's great. That's, that's a good start. But faith requires more feeding, and so part of that is going to be reflection. Okay, so what am I seeking? So what they say to him is rabbi. Uh, rabbi is a word that's going to show up quite a bit. Uh, it's a, it's, I forget if it's Hebrew or Aramaic. There's not that much difference, to be honest. Uh, but it means my great one. It's not used only for Jesus. It's used for lots of different kinds of teachers. Um, often it is simply translated as teacher, and that's fine. Um, well, you answered my, my initial question then, didn't you? Because I couldn't remember if it was Hebrew or Aramaic, but now that you mentioned Rabboni, we're told that Rabboni is Aramaic. So rabbi has to be Hebrew. So they call him rabbi. And then for the sake of, of Greek speakers, and understand that, that the Jews at this point were speaking Greek. Um, the only time they really would have used Hebrew much would have been inside the synagogue when the Bible's being read. But even the sermon is probably not in Hebrew. It's a little bit like the Amish, where the Amish will, they can speak English to associate with the English, but they'll use their kind of plot Deutsch to, to talk to themselves. It's like an, it's, it's kind of a unique form of German. But the Bible that they use in church, in their church, is the Luther Bible, which is high German, Hochdeutsch. Um, it's kind of weird. Uh, one of the great things about the Christian religion is there's not, there's not one commanded language that everybody has to know. Like, like in Islam, you don't buy an English Quran. It'll be marked uh, an English interpretation of the Quran because they would say the Quran can't be translated. Well, the Bible is written in Greek. It's written in Hebrew and Aramaic. But when you read it in English, you have the Bible because God is living. Um, and, and Pentecost shows us the gospel is fit for all languages. So instead of making all students learn Greek or Latin or German or, you know, 17th century English. The gospel is proclaimed in the language the people speak. So um, for, for this reason, then, you have interpretations every now and then, just in case you don't know Hebrew, rabbi means teacher. Um, I mean, the word synagogue itself is a Greek word. I think, in the, I think in the synagogues, they've been using Greek for hundreds of years by this point. So. In verse 30, Jesus issues them an invitation. Come and see. You notice he doesn't go into this lengthy, uh, I'm now going to give you the 14 reasons why you should follow me right now. He just says, come and see. This is great instruction for us as, as we invite others to participate in the blessings of Jesus. We don't necessarily have to argue them into the faith. Well, why should I come to church? Why, why should I follow Jesus? Come and see. Come, come with me as I meet with him and, and see what I see. And then when you see, you'll see forgiveness of sins. You'll see blessings. You'll see instruction in living. And you'll see hopefulness for the future. Stability, sanity. I mean, things that you just don't find much in the world, you'll find in, in the preaching of the gospel. So Jesus' uh, answer to them is very instructive. Come and see. You'll, you'll see it. But this is, not, this is not terribly mystical, actually, because he continues. Um, later on, he'll tell them what they're going to see. But we're told these two disciples, one of them is Andrew, right? The other one, we're not told who it is. Um, Andrew is the brother of Simon Peter. Um, and Andrew becomes kind of a, a first New Testament missionary because when he hears, his first impulse is, 
oh, Simon's got to hear this. Right? So, I know someone that can benefit from this, my brother. I'm going to go grab him and bring him to Jesus. And he does. And Jesus meets him. Ah, Simon Peter. And he does that thing that God does a lot, which is he takes his saints and he gives them a new name. Now, remember, what was Adam's job in the garden? Naming the creatures. That was his exercise of dominion, or to put it into English, lordship over creation. Well, Jesus is exercising his lordship over Simon Peter by renaming him, but it's not arbitrary. It's a prophecy. Who are you? So you're Simon, the son of John. Um, <clears throat> John is just kind of a, uh, it's, it's a Greek, it's the Greek form of the, of the name uh, Jonah. As a matter of fact, in the, in the King James, you'll have Simon described in, in Matthew 16 as Simon bar Jonah, right? Son of Jonah. And uh, so you're Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas. Now, Jesus is doing some wordplay. I, because cognates are all over the place and I see them everywhere, I, I'm never sure how clever Jesus is being. I like to give him lots of credit. So I think he's probably being pretty clever. But his, Simon's name is Peter. But that's just the Greek form of Cephas, right? Cephas is Aramaic. And it means rock. Peter is Greek. And it means, yeah, it means rock. But understand, like, in English, we use rock in different ways. So, like, um, once we dug down below the, the water table, we hit rock. That's bedrock, right? That's the kind of rock that covers acres and acres and acres and miles, right? But also, when I was a kid, I used to huck rocks across the creek. Well, I'm not hucking bedrock across the creek. It's a stone, you know, not quite a pebble, but, you know, a good hucking rock fits in your hand. That's the sense in which Peter means rock. In Matthew 16, Jesus does wordplay with this. I tell you that you are stone, you know, a stone, and on this bedrock, Jesus changes the gender of the term to switch from huck and rock to bedrock, right? That's one of the reasons that Peter in Matthew 16 can't, or a rock in Matthew 16 cannot mean the man Peter. But um, it means rock. Now, Oh, he's hard-headed. It's such a great prophecy. Because Cephas, it sounds like another Greek word, kephale, which means head, right? So like um, encephalitis, right? It's, it's an inflammation within the head, right? So uh, there, there may also be a little wordplay with he's going to be the head. He is, he is kind of a... He's going to function as the, the, spokes, the spokesman of the 12. Yeah, Simon's his given name. It's, it's, it's related to the name Simeon. Um, on the other hand, when Paul in Galatians relates the time that, that Simon Peter briefly apostatizes, Paul says, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. So Paul uses Cephas again, even though everyone by that point was probably calling him Peter. The funny thing is, is Peter is the one that vouches for Paul uh, when, when he's brought into Jerusalem as a, as a Christian. But they have a strained relationship because Paul rebukes Cephas rightly, by the way, because Peter falls in with the Judaizers. The righteous man loves the rebuke. The, yeah, the righteous man loves the rebuke, and Peter, he's righteous, but he's stubborn. He's he's got a rock for a head. Peter is 
is a funny job. We all relate to Peter. Literally the same chapter of the Bible. Yes. The same incident. <laughs> yeah, in the, in the same chapter of the Bible, Peter says of, of or Jesus says of Peter, you know, blessed are you for flesh and blood has not revealed this my, my father in heaven and I'll build the rock on, or I'll, I'll build the church on this rock. And then in the same instance, Jesus has to say, get thee behind me, Satan. You have in mind not the things of God, but the things of men. Which is why we all love Peter. It's like, Jesus loves Peter. And if Jesus loves Peter, Jesus can love us too. <laughs> all right, uh, 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open, heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. So the next day, Jesus goes to Galilee. That is the wrong place for any self-respecting Messiah to be. Galilee is Gentile territory. I mean, Samaria is, that's half-breed territory in the mind of, of, of the Jew, because the Samaritans were like distant, long lost cousins of Israel. They're mixed. They shouldn't be. Um, Galilee is just... It's all Gentile. Um, there, there were uh, Jewish settlements in Galilee, but a lot of them were there. You know, Nazareth, for example, was a place where there were a number of Jews living and they would work building like uh, Caesarema or Caesarea. I, I don't remember if it was Maritima or Philippi, but one of them, uh, or Sepphoris. You know, one of the, there's like a big settlement that was being built just adjacent. And so Joseph was kind of a contractor there. Jesus works with him. And uh, Nazareth is not the kind of place where any self-respecting Messiah would be caught to say nothing of being from. And yet Jesus grows up in Nazareth, right? After the return to Egypt, they don't go back to Bethlehem. They go back to where they're from, Nazareth. And so they're up in Galilee. And Philip says to, uh, you know, he's there. And Jesus finds Philip. This is, this is how conversion works, right? It's not that Philip finds Jesus. Jesus finds Philip. Tremendous comfort in this. Because one, it's intentional. Jesus intended to find Philip. But two, man is in his fallen state by nature, dead in sin and trespasses, not seeking. Jesus comes and finds us. And so it is with Philip. And he says to Philip the same thing, follow me. So Philip is from Bethsaida. That's the same city that Andrew and Peter are from. And then what does Philip do? Same thing Andrew does. He finds Nathaniel. He says, guess what, Nathaniel? We've all been waiting for that one that the whole Bible talks about, the one that Moses prophesied about, the one that all the prophets are prophesying about. We found him. And he tells him his identity, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Well, Jesus is of Nazareth because that's where he, he grows up. That's his, his hometown. Um, why does he call him the son of Joseph? Because that's what he knows about him. So Philip's faith is not yet, it's, it's existent. Philip has faith, but it's, it's not tremendously informed yet. Right? Faith has to be nurtured, it has to be fed, and he has to learn. So as far as he knows, he's the son of Joseph. He'll learn later that, that, that Christ is in fact born of the Virgin. But for now, for now. right. 
And yeah, and, and this is how people in Nazareth would know him. It's Jesus, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel, of course, asks the question, which is, is, is fairly obvious, really. So Messiah comes from Nazareth. Can anything good come, come out of Nazareth? Right, and we've talked about this already. So Philip responds to him the same way that Jesus responded earlier, come and see. Again, not this long argument about, I'm gonna totally own him with three points that he can't refute. Just come and see. So they're gonna do that. So Jesus sees Nathanael coming toward him. What does that mean? We're gonna find out. Jesus says of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Now, when Jesus says this of Nathanael, I don't know if he's being sarcastic, as in like Nathanael is known for being a deceitful person. And so, you know, it's like calling a, a fat guy tiny, you know, but I suspect it's, it, it, it is, a, is a, a genuine confession of, of who Nathanael is, that he, he's known for being a pretty upright sort of guy. And He's an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. By the way, who is Israel again? Israel is Jacob. Was, yeah, was Jacob deceitful? His name means deceitful. So it's more wordplay. I mean, a, a true Israelite, you would think, would be a very deceitful person if for no other reason than the man Israel was a very deceitful man whose original name meant deceitful. But this, this confession indicates Jesus knows Nathaniel. Now, in English has lots of words for the same thing, and it's, it's rare that other languages get the leg up, but both Spanish and German distinguish between no and no, right? In Spanish, you have saber versus conocer. In German, you have kennen versus wessen, right? Um, you can, so like, I know that two plus two is four, but I also know my hometown. You see the difference? Or you can know uh, the date that man landed on the moon, or you can know a person, like I know what they're like, who they are. It's not just that Jesus knows in the mind the facts about who Nathaniel is. He knows him. He knows what sort of man he is. This is a confession of Jesus' omni omniscience. He's all-knowing. He knows all things. And as a matter of fact, this is what Nathaniel realizes. Um, cause Nathaniel says, how do you know me? Right? What Jesus says causes Nathaniel to understand he's got my number. He knows exactly who I am. And so, uh, well, Jesus said, well, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. This does not mean that Jesus has really good vision. He sees him because he's God. This is a confession of his omnipresence, that not only does he know all things, he's everywhere. He sees all things, right? Jesus wasn't there when that happened, but he saw it nonetheless because he's God. And Nathaniel understands it right away. He, he knows exactly what he just heard. I don't think we have the calling of Judas, but, but it, Jesus will make plain that he knows who Judas is and what he's going to do. Because Judas has a, has a role that's appointed to him. Right. Yeah, I, I saw you there under the fig tree. Well, you weren't there. How do you even know there was a fig tree? He's God. So Nathaniel immediately understands and he confesses, Rabbi, you're the son of God. So Nathaniel doesn't hesitate. He knows, Jesus knows who I am. He saw me under the fig tree. He must be the son of God. Now, did, did Nathaniel hear the preaching of John the Baptist? We're not told, but this is part of the content of John the Baptist's preaching, that this is the son of God. And so he immediately, you know, you are the son of God. Now, this, this confession is correct but Jesus will confirm this confession with signs all throughout the gospel. Yeah, right. Nathaniel gives a great confirmation student answer. Um, 
So he's encountered the man who knows all things and is everywhere. Well, this, he must be God. He confesses him as the king of Israel, and this is, this is a little foreshadowing, right? Because where is Jesus proclaimed the king of Israel? On the cross, right? Where Pilate has inscribed Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. So Jesus, he responds back to Nathaniel and he says, what, because you saw this, you believe? You get the idea in the Bible that seeing is okay, but there are better things than seeing. What, you, you believe just because you saw this? That's, of course, great comfort for us 2,000 years later because we're pretty far removed from anyone who saw with their eyes. We have the word, though, and the word is certain. Um, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You'll see greater things than this. Like what? That's the rest of the book of John. Right? What sorts of things is Nathaniel going to see that's greater than Jesus seeing him under the fig tree? It's an invitation to continue into John 2 all the way to the end of the book. Right? What sorts of things will Nathaniel see? Read on. And then <clears throat> Jesus tells Nathaniel, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, who is it who sees the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man? Jacob does in Bethel. Right, we will eventually as well. Where will we see this? In the crucifixion. Irenaeus thought, we can't, we can't say definitively, but I, I like the, the sentiment anyway. Irenaeus thought that what Jacob saw was the crucified Christ. Um, but notice they're not ascending and descending on a ladder. They're ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What is the bridge between heaven and earth? Christ, the Son of Man, right? This, this is where heaven and earth touch, is in the man Jesus. That's what was meant back in verse 14, that the word was made flesh. Anything else on these verses? All right, next week we're going to talk about the wedding at Cana. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.